Hi everybody, my name is Thiago Souza, I'm a civil engineer in South America area. I wish a good evening to everyone. It's a special night for Brazilian geotechnical community. We have a very, very interesting presentation today with Dr. Suzanne Lagasse. The issue of her presentation is reliability and the risk approach for the design and safety evaluation of dams. I'm very happy because we have people from different countries, regions, culture, and it's very important because that is the core of Chodekinia Brazil. Dr. Lacassi is the technical director of the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. NGI. She is from Canada and nowadays she lives in Oslo, Norway. She completed her first degree, a Bachelor of Arts in French Literature at the University of Montreal, Canada. And she is a civil engineer in Ecole Polytechnique and MIT. She speaks English and French. She gave a ranking lecture at Imperial College in London in 2015, Tesag Lecture in 2001, and Tesag Curation in September 2013. She is recognized and she is a strong reference in geotechnical engineering. I would like to encourage you to subscribe to the Kenya Brazil YouTube channel and in another social media like Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn and Telegram. So, Dr. Lacasse, thanks again, and I invite you to start your presentation. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Suzanne Lacasse, I am from NGI, and it's a pleasure for me to give you a lecture today on reliability and risk approach for the design and safety evaluation of them. I wish to thank Tiago Souza for having invited me. And it's different, but we will do this on remote. The contents of my lecture on reliability and risk. First, we will look at some concepts, safety factor, safety margin and reliability index, acceptable and tolerable risk. And should we think in terms of deterministic, or probabilistic safety targets. Then I will give a few examples of reliability-based results before coming to conclusions. When one does a safety assessment, there's a perception in our profession that the design with the safety factor of 1.5 or greater has to be safe. But reality is not so simple. A safety factor of 1.5 represents actually a spectrum of failure probabilities. When you do traditional analysis, deterministic analysis, you look at a nominal case, one scenario, without considering the entire spectrum of plausible outcomes, and this does not quantify the likelihood of the outcome. When you do the probabilistic analysis, it identifies the uncertainties that are key to the safety and attempts to include all plausible scenarios, their likelihood and their consequences. Uncertainties are often represented by a normal statistical distribution or a long normal. But the long normal decision looks like shown this figure and it's a way of expressing uncertainties. You have a mean, a standard deviation, and uh, you can calculate the coefficient of variation, which is a variation, variation, 
or the ratio, sorry, of the standard deviation to the mean. The safety margin, and this is not new. This is, was already presented, the I code bulletin 1988, number 88 in 1993 by Pierre Londe. The safety margin is in fact the difference between the resistance and the load. So if you, if you illustrate the safety margin as shown here uh, with a mean M and values greater than zero are shown here and values less than zero to the left of the vertical axis, the safety margin is the distance between the mean of this safety margin and a value of zero. And the probability of failure will be expressed as the number of cases relative where the safety margin can be less than zero. And this probability of failure tells you the likelihood that a failure may occur. And the safety margin, it expresses the potential overlap of the uncertainty distribution of the load, shown in blue, and the resistance, shown in green, and this overlap, possible overlap, is the, the failure probability. And this is what uh, you find out by considering the uncertainty. By just considering deterministic values, you do not get this knowledge. Let's take a case where we have a safety factor of 1.5 and small uncertainty. Shown here, safety factor 1.5, the green arrow. The probability of failure is the zone under the curve here, including the uncertainty in the safety factor, where the safety factor can be less than 1. Second case, same safety factor, 1.5 but a larger uncertainty, so then the distribution is much more flat. It's more diffuse, as we call it. So same factor safety 1.5. The probability of failure, the zone where the safety factor can be less than 1, is much larger. If we superpose those two diagrams, you have the same factor safety, but very different margin of safety and very different failure probabilities, as illustrated by the overlap of the blue and the red zones, the failure probability. And with this classical figure that's been published many times or repeated many times, a higher safety factor does not necessarily mean a higher, a larger safety margin. As illustrated in this analysis, this is a true case study for slope stability. The case where the uncertainty is low has a low probability of failure. The probability of failure is 1 in 10,000 years, which is low. That's about 10 to minus, that is 10 to minus 4. In the case of a large uncertainty uh, slope, it has a safety factor that is higher, it's mean, but the probability of failure represented with the zone under the curve here is once in a hundred years. Now, we talk about failure probabilities, and nobody likes to hear the word failure, at least certainly not our clients. So more, more positive wording would be to talk about a reliability index, beta. And this is defined as the mean safety factor minus 1 divided by the standard deviation. It's an expression of the distance to the point zero here. And it would be much more positive to talk about this because reliability in Portuguese is confiabilidade, which means trustworthiness. So maybe instead of speaking about failure probability, we should really be talking about the reliability index or the trustworthiness of our constructions.
there is a fairly simple relationship between reliability index and failure probability. Here I have illustrated the one for the uh, uh, no, uh, normal distribution. You have those for log normal distribution and such. And it's also in this graph you have the failure probability on the vertical axis and the reliability index on the horizontal axis. And then uh, if you have a failure probability of 10 to minus 3, you have a reliability index of about 3, not exactly 3. And for 10 to minus 4, you have a reliability index of 4. Now, how one, one defines risk in the, in the literature, there are many different definitions. But for most of the technical science, <laughs> not the social science, or technical science, risk is a function of the hazard and the consequences. And the hazard is defined as a temporal problem of likelihood of the occurrence of a threat. So that is the probability of occurrence. This is what I call the failure probability in many of the examples before. And the consequence, that's a function of the vulnerability of the element at risk, their exposure, and the value of the element at risk. And this picture here is a landslide that occurred in Norway about uh, 30 years ago. So how we describe risk? Well, you can use qualitative methods, and those are very good. And here's one, a qualitative risk matrix, with the low risk shown in green, the medium risk in orange, and the high risk in red. And this matrix is the hazard category, which represents the likelihood or the failure probability, divided in five classes from low to very high, and the consequence category, class one to five, from less severe or insignificant to very severe, which could include loss of life. Even if these concepts are fairly simple, they bring up the discussion of the uncertainties. And this always leads to an improved understanding of what is important for design, for the safety evaluation, and if there's a need of monitoring of performance. So these simplified matrices are very useful. But you can also describe this in a more quantitative manner. And what we use, or what has been used for a number of years, are FN diagrams. FN diagrams is a graph showing the annual likelihood or annual probability of a failure versus a consequence. I have shown here the one's number of fatalities between 1 and 10,000, but you can express that in terms of uh, losses, in terms of economy, you can, in increasing degree of um, pollution or exposure to uh, nuclear radiations and such. But in these diagrams, you define a zone where the risk is unacceptable and a zone where the risk is acceptable. There are a number of national guidelines for dams and dikes and for man-made slopes. And these are shown here in the zone in gray for there are about 15 different countries that have already issued guidelines of what should be the level of acceptable and unacceptable risk. The relationship that is most used is the one with the black line. And, the, and it's approximately an average in between what are the recommended values today. The area in orange are for very low probability and high risk events and uh, in those cases you have to do some very special estimation. I will not talk about that here very much. But on such a diagram the values can be compared to corresponding values for other dams, for other constructed facilities, in terms of likelihood of occurrence and in terms of consequence. So it's a very useful uh, tool and for example, there are many countries that have their regulation and function of the consequences only. And these two dots here illustrate that you can have a dam with 
same amount of consequences, but very different probability of failure. So, for example, if you have a dam with an annual property of failure, 10 to the minus 6 or so, it plots here. But if it's 10 to the minus 5 or 2 times 10 to the minus 5, it plots here in the area which is not acceptable. So, looking at only consequences is not uh, sufficient. One also has to look at the likelihood of an event occurring. And once you have placed your point there, then you can decide how you want to reduce your risk. You can either reduce the likelihood by rehabilitating a dam, for example, or you can reduce the consequences by uh, increasing the warning time or uh, in having programs to alert people that are efficient. Here is the first diagram, these FN, what we call FN diagrams, that was uh, published by Bob Whitman in his uh, Terzaghi lecture in 1984. Um, in his diagram, these are 1984 numbers, there was the losses in money on the horizontal axis at the bottom, and the number of lives lost at the time. Again, this is 1984 uh, quantities. And this diagram showed the perception at the time that how often different civil engineering facilities fail. So like mine, Pittsburgh failed quite often, but had relatively little consequences in terms of people dying, whereas um, the mobile drill rigs with people on board had a number of life loss, and, but still occurred quite often, 10 to the minus 2 is what we would call quite often. Whereas dams were placed in this area, again that was the perception, this was drawn on paper at MIT in the old days, and commercial aviation was put here. Now, and there are lines of a drawn, acceptable risk would be here, and marginally acceptable here, based on experience and perception of those things. Now, if we superpose the zone that we've just seen of the guidelines prepared by the different countries, is this area here, shown in kind of bluish color, and then what I call the line that was the most used is the dark line in the middle of that distribution. So, the guidelines that have been prepared since 1984 are somewhat stricter than what was the perception in 1984. Now, what do those numbers need, mean, this 10 to the minus 4 per year or so? Well, what is the risk of being alive today? The risk of a dam breach is never zero. But neither is the background risk associated that we are alive on Earth. If you look here at the annual probability of death for all causes, for us human beings, whether you're a male or a female, when you're born, the risk is maybe about 1% per year. And then as you grow a bit older, become two years old, the risk gets lower. But in your lifetime, the risk is never lower than 10 to the minus 4 here. This is, these are numbers based on Statistics Canada. The United States use similar number, but they do not differentiate between male and female. So between the age of 5 and 12, a uh, female or a male have an annual probability of failure of 10 to the minus 4. Now to Look at how what this diagram means. Let's say that we extend it up to 90 years old. If you are 90 years old, this diagram tells you that the probability of dying in the next year is 10%, which is not nice to think about, but it's a reality of life. If you are 60 years old, the annual probability of dying in the next year is one, about 1%. 
And this is one of the reasons why, in many cases, a target of 10 to the minus 4 is used. It's, it has been used for offshore platforms. It's used in the diagram that I showed you, 10 to the minus 4 corresponded to 10 deaths for dams and for man-made slopes and such. So uh, it, it, it's not an unreasonable value if one wants to think about in terms of target. Now, should we think about a deterministic or a probabilistic target when we talk about dam safety? What should be the safety target during the life of a dam? Is it a fixed deterministic safety factor appropriate that ensures the same level of safety throughout a dam life? A dam in operation for 50 years represents 50 years of evaluated experience under operational and environmental load. The uncertainties at the time of design are, and during construction are not the same 30 years and 40 years and 50 years during the lifetime. You have observed how the dam has behaved. Sometimes they behave perfectly. Sometimes they have problems or there's some leakage or cracks occur in the concrete and such. So, and so a, a fixed factor safety of 1.5 without accounting with the change in the uncertainty and change in other aspects in the lifetime of the, of the dam is not representative of the actual situation during the lifetime. So a target annual probability of failure allows for more consistent comparison of the safety level at different times of the life of the dam than a fixed or prescribed safety factor. Now I'm going to move to a few examples of reliability based results. The first is an 84 two and a half meter high Rockfield Dam. The snow is in Norway. <laughs> it's a, all Rockfield Dams are beautiful when they uh, rehabilitate. <laughs> and here I'm going to look only at the stability of the slope. The, the slope did not have the, there's a requirement of the maximum inclination of the slope in Norway and it was slightly above what was required. And the safety factor was slightly below than what was required. So we did a stability analysis deterministically and probabilistically, doing a thousand Monte Carlo simulation. So this is very quick. It's like doing a thousand stability analysis, but in an automated way, but accounting for the uncertainties in the parameters. And we came both deterministically and probabilistically to two more critical slip surface, the one shown here is slip surface A and slip surface B. The core is shown with the grayish material in the middle, and then the lines are pore pressure contours. And I want to discuss with you only one of the uncertainties, but it's a very important one. It was the friction angle in the rock field. The second value of the friction angle is a function of the effective stress and the type and quality of rock fields. Now, there are oodles and oodles of data. The tests run all over the world and run in Norway, the NGI laboratory too. And lines have been drawn of where the values of the friction angles plot with respect to the effective stress on the horizontal axis. And the upper line is for high density, well compacted, well graded, very strong particles in the rock field. And the lower dot, dotted line is the low density, poorly compacted, poorly graded, weak particles, the, the other end of type of rock field. The average values is shown with the black, black line. And the red line are the regulations in Norway, but NVE, that is the authority for safety of dams. And what this figure shows, it shows a distribution or the uncertainty into the, in the value of the friction angle for the rock field. For the sliding surface A and sliding surface B, 
the uncertainty is shown by the arrow, but in the analysis, in order to satisfy the authorities, we use the value shown by the full lines here. So and there were other uncertainties, the unit weight, and uh, pole pressure line, etc. But to make the story short, the main factor was the friction angle. So the result of the analysis was for slip surface A, which was a shallow one, and slip surface B, the deterministic safety factor was 1.5 and 1.3, which was below the requirement. The requirement was 1.5. The failure probability calculated was once or less than in one million years, so that's 10 to the minus 6 per year. And this is considered certainly acceptable in all of the diagrams that have been shown. And the analysis provides you the distribution of the probability for the safety factor, and then you can calculate uh, graphically also what is the probability of having a safety factor less than 1. The second case, which is a smaller dam, only 30 meter high, but also in the Magnet Dams, it's in uh, middle North Norway. Here is the dam, and the spillway is here, and it's, it's a fairly old dam. And here is during rehabilitation, uh, a number of measures have been taken. The, the dam was raised and the rock field was improved. And we will discuss the spillway in a minute. And here is the finished dam. Beautiful, isn't it? And for here, we did a probabilistic analysis. Uh, in, the, in the old days, it was to see how reliability analysis could be useful. It was not a specific problem at that time. So we did that with the event trees, and the processes is to do first do the dam site inspection and analyze what are the potential failure modes, an agreement on the, how you would describe uncertainty in terms of probability, and then construct the event trees, assess the probability, evaluate the results, and most of the time we do an iteration. This is usually done in a workshop format with experts and stakeholders and engineers, people knowing how the dam has behaved and the details of the structure. The most important step is the, the analysis of potential failure modes and both the weaknesses in the dam, internal erosion, slides on the upstream and downstream slopes, uh, rock slide in the reservoir, plane of weakness in the bedrock foundation, operation error, Operator, sorry, and the external triggers like floods that would be like extreme rainfall or in the summer. But in the winter, we also have extreme snow that smelt, melt and then create more water. Uh, earthquake, melting of glacier, and this would contribute to an increased flood, sabotage, terror, and meteor and plane crash. Although this was quite a problem. The failure modes in bold are the ones that were the most, I would say, the most plausible, and they were analyzed in detail. Although the plane crash was also analyzed, but the problem with it was so low that it was valid after a while. The inventory analysis is a what happens if type of analysis, where we look at initiation, continuation, and progression to potential breach failure. And this, what I show here, because it's easy to read, is a textbook example from Hartford and Becker of an earthquake striking a dam with a certain probability, 10 to the minus 5, that, that was uh, once in uh, 100,000 years. Um, and then you look, uh, are the gate closed or are the gate operable? Uh, and then you assign a probability to this. When you assign the probability, the events have to be mutually exclusive. So the sum of the probabilities has to be 1. 0.1 plus 0.9 gives 1. But let's say we continue that the gates are closed and, closed and inoperable. Then do you lose 
there's a more control or do you not? Now, there are steps in between, but this is just an academic example. And again, you evaluate what is the probability of losing the control of the reservoir, which was estimated as 0.7 here. And if I just continue on this branch here, then the, when you lose control of the reservoir, will the dam fail by overtopping or will it not fail? And it is most probable that it will fail by overtopping, so it has a very high probability of 0.9. So the probability of a failure mode following this path is the product of all of these is 6.3, 10 to the minus 7. Now, this is just a class, a book example. The probabilities of the node of a tree, they're based on statistical estimate, based on observation, test results, what has happened to them before, measurements of pore pressure, for example, measurement of leakage. Engineering calculation with models like I've done for the slope stability uh, for the previous dam, and, but that you do in a probabilistic format, or with expert judgment developed to evaluate experience. That's why we have the workshop, so we can get the benefit of this expert and this experience. And it's Steve Vick that quoted in this book, the probability estimate should be based on a demonstrable chain of reasoning and not on speculation. Consensus is achieved through discussion using standard descriptors of uncertainty. He also said that the collective judgment of experts and stakeholders structured within a process of debate can yield as good an assessment of probabilities as mathematical analysis. Too fast. I was sure in the previous slide was showing you an example of an event tree uh, in a complex fashion, and what it was telling you is that the failure probability of using event tree analysis is the sum of all the branches that can lead to failure. It was also showing. Um, that you have to document the reason why you've chosen the probabilities. Um, and so and usually we have a set of tables following the trees, which, which each step of the analysis, and saying the reason why the probability values were chosen. And sometimes people don't agree, so there's a discussion, and at the end then we get a consensus. So these processes can take a bit of time. Now the results of this analysis before rehabilitation uh, in the first case that was done a few years ago, the analysis was done under the seismic, I mean, earthquake, impact, uh, flood, and for internal erosion. And at first, the analysis was done in the traditional manner. But what was suddenly discovered is somebody asked the question, what if the spillway is blocked because of hard snow or ice in the spillway and then in the tunnel? And when we calculated the failure probability, that became by far the highest uh, probability of failure. 3, 10 to the minus 3, that is very high in terms of discussions of uh, safety for dams. So all of a sudden it became a failure mode which had not been thought about, came up to the surface, and we, we needed to analyze it. Why was that? Well, the crew went to the dam and took this picture. Here's the dam. Said, can you see a dam? Well, you can see a little bit of the top here, <laughs> but this is Norway. <laughs> this is West Norway, isolated area. We have snow <laughs> all the time. And the only indication of a spillway is here, this little depression here. What has happened? It was suddenly realized that the way it was constructed, the prevailing winds and the amount of snow coming on this dam required some work. So after having obtained this low, this high probability of failure, 10 to the minus 3, or even higher, 10 to the minus 3, 
There were a number of reapplications that was done also for other reasons, but the most important for our problem right now, a new spillway was built or expanded. The uh, structure was built to keep the spillway open during very snowy, windy winters. We will look at that. And then increase the drainage capacity in the tunnel. And then when we cal I will show you pictures in, in a few minutes. When we, we did the calculation with the new spillway, and then we if we looked at the case of ice flooding and ice and hard snow blocking the spillway, then the annual property of failure became 2 to 10 to the minus 7. And for example, earthquake. In earthquake, they're not very large in Norway, at least in that uh, part of Norway, so 10 to minus 8, there was no worry. And then this was a dam that has experienced very little leakage, where measurements are done, and the probability of failure due to uh, internal erosion was also quite low. But this was the important one, this was 10 to minus 3 before, 3 10 to the minus 3. And here is the picture of the dam after it had been rehabilitated. And what is this construction here? <laughs> it, it looks very new. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Here's a spillway. It's the same location as before. And there's this construction during the winter, one of the winters. This is not the most snowy winters, but the beautiful with snow, isn't it? And that was the spillway that I showed you earlier before rehabilitation, and here is the construction, which has been built in a direction so that it accumulates snows on top, and it, no snow comes in front of it, and these holes here are the ones that would prevent the water when it melts, or the ice is when it melts, it would go down into the tunnel, and here, I think here is a tunnel, there's hardly any snow, this was completely blocked before the construction, and for those of you who can see, there's my Norwegian engineer here. They're all at least two meter high, so this is a large tunnel, and which is much happier today than it was before the rehabilitation. But just to look at the risk picture comparing with other dams, um, here's a statistic for failure of uh, embankment dams due to internal erosion. And the, these are the values for American dams, dams in the United States. This is statistics for all embankment dams in the world. So the statistic is maybe yeah, close to 10 to minus 4 per year. 10 to minus 3 means it happens once in 1,000 years. 10 to the minus 6 means it happens once in, in uh, 10 to minus 5, sorry, it means once in 100,000 years. Now, if we see for our, the name of it was Trapladalen Dam, it's a difficult name. Before the rehabilitation, the annual property of failure was high as that, much higher than the statistics for dams, for internal erosion. Internal erosion is the most frequent failure cause for embankment dams. But after rehabilitation, we're talking 10 to minus 5, which appears much more acceptable than uh, before. Comparing risk level is a very important task of the reliability analysis. And here's another dam. It's called Paul's Bull Dam. <laughs> it's a Norwegian name. It means the, the dam of Mr. Paul. Um, it's a concrete dam that was built during the war by the Germans. <laughs> it took a long time to build it. And it, it's an unusual design. You find that mainly in the northern countries. It's a type of unburson dam, but it, it's not exactly that either. It's a very narrow concrete dam at the top, and then it has these plates here and uh, room inside. Uh, the power station was built much later, in 2000 or so. And what was interesting, we were asked to do a reliability analysis of the concrete dam. Because it's old, we don't know too much how it was built, but apparently it was well built by the Germans. If you have a bird's eye view, there's the station here, the power station, sorry about the Norwegian here, and the concrete dam is here, it's about uh, 700 meters long, but it has uh, abutments that are <laughs> um, 
that are embankment dams. And then but, but the job we were giving was to look at the concrete dam. <laughs> so it, it's, it's a busy dam in terms of there's a, a highway here that's used by people, <laughs> plus this power station. But again, it, it, there's a history to that dam and very little information. So we did, we did the analysis uh, with the Ventry and with Monte Carlo analysis. And then <laughs> the, the concrete dam was doing fine. And believably, it was very, the concrete was not altered at all. There were no chemical reaction, no cracks. <laughs> so, so the concrete Ambersen type dam came with an annual property of failure, maybe 5 10 to minus 5, with maybe uh, their warning system. So the, the, in the first uh, hour, there were maybe just seven people exposed. In, in the space of 48 hours, there were 55 or 80 people exposed, but then they, there's a warning system, so then they could be evacuated. But lo and behold, we looked at these uh, earth field dams, these embankment dams on the right side and left side. And the one on the right side, in fact, it, it, again, there's very little information and it, it has been rehabilitated by placing some uh, riprap's. But uh, the uncertainties are so large that they ended up with an annual property of failure 10 to minus 3. So this one would be rehabilitated instead of this one. And using diagrams like this is very good for communication with the people in the company. I added inside a few examples. Uh, New Hellevatten Dam, this is the first one you saw. The reliability index failure probability of the downstream slope suggested no need for rehabilitation, even if the traditional safety factor suggested the need for strengthening. So, this was a good way of saving money. For Dravladalen Dam, the second one you saw, the failure mode ana analyzed. It led to an indication of a so far unidentified high risk assessment, uh, high risk, sorry, associated with the threat of ice and hard snow. And the analysis also documented the risk reduction with the rehabilitation. I did not show you that. Other benefits we've had is the, the Nation Dam, which you have not seen. It's a main dam and five saddle dams. The analysis showed that the optimal solution was a control over topping of saddle dam 4 during an extreme flood. So by letting saddle dam 4 go to failure, it had hardly any consequences except the destruction of the forest. It, redu it reduced considerably the risk of a breach of the main dam. And then, then this was a way of preventing any uh, disaster of uh, people losing their lives. There's a fourth dam, the Vital Vidalsvatten Dam. <laughs> Sorry, all the names are different in Norway and difficult. They have evidence internal erosion during the first 20 of its 50 years life. The analysis quantified the risk reduction of several rehabilitation measures and showed that the most extensive and expensive measure was not the most risk-reducing measure. And this is also important. If you can save millions and millions of dollars, then you should use the option that gives you most benefit, reduces the risk the most. Since this is electron dam, I have to mention, although this is not the main topic of it, tailings dam. You have heard about that many times in Brazil, and uh, Professor Morgenstern was here not long ago to give a fabulous lecture on this. But what's important to realize that most of the failures, the causes of failures of these tailings stands, are of a geotechnical nature. This is a statistics by iCode. And you can't read the detail, but the, the most important causes are slope stability, foundation problems, seismic instability, erosion, and seepage. And in the ICO study that looked at, it, it's a big, it's in 2001, it's a bit old, that looked at 221 failures, all of the failures were found to be avoidable according to ICO. And then Santa Marina in the science in 2019, 
he showed the catastrophic failure that have occurred in tailings and with uh, ash ash filled deposits. And on the left, he shows the release volumes, which are in at the top 300 million cubic meter. And on the right is the human losses, and, and you are aware of the all unfortunate accidents that happened in Brazil in recent years. <clears throat> and Professor Morgenstern said, here, at this time, there is a crisis associated with concern over the safety of Tailings Dam and lack of trust in their design and performance. And I wish to say that by introducing risk and reliability concept, this is, NGI is working on this now, by introducing such concept in the evaluation of Tailings Dam would help document the safety level and screen the cases that need urgent attention to prevent accidents for example, that's what happened in Brumadinho. I've come to my summary on reliability and risk assessment. It's very important to analyze the plausible way a dam can fail and the associated consequences. We can rank the dams in a portfolio and focus monitoring programs and rehabilitation actions on the aspects with the highest risk. And the assessments can be adjusted over the entire lifetime of the dam to account for changes, improvement, and deterioration. So probabilistic analysis with insight in reliability add insight to the deterministic value. They help reduce uncertainty, focus on cost effectiveness, and are an ideal tool for looking at alternatives. The results help us make what we call risk-informed decision, which has become a requirement in ISO uh, since 2015. ISO is the International Standard Organization. We have to be aware that the failure probability is never zero. Safety factor alone is not enough to know the actual safety level, safety margin. We need to quantify and deal with the uncertainties. And it's not only the geology or the ground that needs to be included. It is a system of components, and it is also the way we work together in a team. So I'm quoting a, a citation from a tailings that reported, safety is no accident. Disasters are often seen as fast events, such as those shown here. But disasters are built up slowly. Because hazard and vulnerability change with time, and because we're not adequately prepared. So in conclusion, we should not be discussing deterministic versus probabilistic analysis. We should rather discuss deterministic and probabilistic analysis. So in conclusion, on the background of the Teton Dam, uh, Earthfield Dam, deterministic analysis with a fixed safety factor gives the impression of certainty or no uncertainty. Just, oh, a factor safety 1.5, I'm fine. Risk-based analysis include the uncertainty explicitly and their effects on the safety margin. They complement the deterministic analysis. For robust and improved design and follow-up of dams, we need to do both. So in my closing slide, um, I've been working for, as a civil engineer for 50 years. And there's a cultural shift in our profession, where <laughs> we used to talk about hazard, now we need to talk about consequences. Where we used to talk about response, we, use, we need to talk about preparing, preparedness and risk reduction. We used to act in a reactive way, we have to be proactive now. And where many of our presentation talks were science driven, now they have to be multidisciplinary. And rather than response management, we should be talking about risk management. 
And when planning for people and society, we should be planning with people and society. Thank you again for asking me to give you this lecture and thank you very much for your attention.